Welcome to all of you. Once again, I have the privilege of being the one who's going to make a brief announcement, and I am going to keep it brief because we have four really talented people who have lots of things to share about transitioning. And so I'm going to go right to them and just say that we're glad you're here, that everybody who's here is here because we want to know more about transitioning. And we've been seeing our friends and family members have transitions, so we're glad that this program is scheduled. And I'm just briefly going to introduce Sarah Neary, who is the apartment social worker, Stacy Edwards, who is our apartment nurse, Jacqueline, who is, but I'm gonna get Jacqueline, Jacqueline Craig, I never get her last name straight. Jacqueline Craig, who is the person who is the leading assisted living here, and Kaylee Gillimore, who is the social worker for the health center and the components there. And each of these ladies, I've been lucky enough to have personal contact with each of them, and I only can say that we are lucky here at Oak Knoll to have the kinds of people that they are. And now they're going to tell us more about what they do, and then there'll be a chance for questions and answers. Sarah, I'm going to turn it over to you, and thank you. I agree. Thank you for that nice introduction. Um, we have decided that if you're the one up here talking, we're gonna we don't we're gonna take our masks down. Um, just want to welcome all of you. This is our first transition talk post COVID, or I should say, post acute COVID. Um, this is something that we typically like to do on a regular basis. You know, usually at least a couple times a year. And we um, alternate with Steve Rowe's, you know, life care contract talk. So he talks a little bit more about the financial um, benefits of the contract and the continuous care. And we are here to describe the nuts and bolts of what it looks like when, when you transition through the levels of care at Oak Knoll. And I say when, it's sometimes an if. I think Steve has some data that shows that roughly a third of our residents go through all three levels of care. Um, the other two thirds either you know, spend the rest of their days in their independent apartment or only use two levels of care. But the, the fact remains that the majority of us will will you know, need to transition to a different level of care at Oak Knoll at some point. Um, I was gonna add to that, that all of us will need additional help and assistance as we get older. I mean, that is just a fact of life. So, um, but that's why you came to Oak Knoll. But I know when you sign that contract, you know, the details of what that actually looks like may not be very clear or you may not be at a point in your life where you're paying particular attention to that very distant place down the road that maybe now, and depending on where you've been, but I think we've all had a little bit of a rough patch with COVID. I think it's safe to say that if we had a little bit of arthritis or if we had a little bit of anxiety or a little bit of a cognitive um, impairment, all of those things have been exacerbated by the stress and the prolonged um, isolation that we've experienced during COVID. So if you're feeling that way, you're not alone. And I think it's across ages and stages. So um, with that, we are gonna do this kind of old school. We've tried it in different ways. We've gone high tech with PowerPoints and things like that. But we really are just gonna speak to you, share each level of care and the services that are provided, and then we really encourage you to, um, as questions come up for you, maybe keep those in the back of your mind and then at the end we'll open it up for, for questions and answers, okay? So, and following the way that, the, that this Oak Knoll system works, we're just gonna start up in independent living. And that's where I 
live, and that's where Stacy Edwards operates. Um, when you come to uh, live at Oak Knoll in your independent apartment, we usually say that the services that we provide are amenities. We're not licensed, we're not a licensed healthcare provider at the independent living stage uh, level. So we, we're not really obligated to provide any kind of healthcare services, but we do know that providing that, um, a network of support and resources that can help you maximize your independent management of your medical affairs is really important and it helps you maintain your independence and your quality of life for longer. Um, so, as I said, independent living is the only level of care, or level of living, I should say, that isn't licensed by the state. So I like to call it the Wild West because <laughs> anything goes up here. Um, not really, but you know, there's not, it's, it's, it's a little bit more fluid and intuitive in terms of the kinds of support that we provide. I certainly, um, and, and I think Stacy and I both feel, we don't have a caseload of 300 people. There's really no way that two people could look after the physical and psychosocial needs of all 300 of you. So we're here as resources for you to come to us when things come up. Um, and I know it's sometimes hard to know what kind of things do, should I call about or when will I know it's a good time to call. And I think we would both say that's a good enough question to make the call. You know, um, the question in and of itself is a good reason to reach out for our support because um, we know that sometimes there's just two heads are better than one when you're when you're confronting an issue. Um, some of the things that I help with are, um, you know, anything from the logistics of moving to Oak Knoll, the psychosocial aspects of moving to Oak Knoll or moving through the levels of care, um, connecting you with resources, whether it's at home with Oak Knoll or you know, transportation or things that are internal to Oak Knoll, but also connecting you to resources that are in the community that might support you. Um. So I guess um, at this point, you know, Stacy and I work really closely together. We share an office, as a matter of fact, and so um, we, we just work really closely. And we, if somebody's having a physical problem, that can sometimes trigger the need for more psychosocial investigation, and vice versa. So, um, but I wanted her to share with you a little bit more specifically what the apartment nurse is designed to provide. Um, yes, so I am the apartment nurse. I know most of you. Um, and when anybody ever asks me like what my job is, it's really hard for me to describe because every day is so different, but that is what I love about it. Um, sometimes I would compare myself to like a, a firefighter, like I'm just waiting for the next fire to put out. <laughs> um, but my real goal as an independent living nurse that I've learned with experience having worked in the health center is it's very different than um, a 24-hour nurse caregiver. My goal is to keep you all caring for yourself because then there's not as many fires that I have to put out. Um, so I, I really, you know, that's always my goal is just checking in to make sure that you're taking care of yourself or that you have the resources you need to do so. Um, and. And I really enjoy that because to me that is um, the, the healing practice of nursing. Um, I'm not physically doing the work, but you're, you're doing the work for yourself. Um, and so um, anytime I can be a part of that just for a little while and then see someone going about you know, as they were before, um, it, it's always good for me to see. Um, I do feel when I see most people in the hallways, they probably either see me answering messages on my phone or talking on my phone or running to the next spot. Um, so I always look busy. I think it's just because, um, you know, we, 
we never know what's going to happen next, or we, you know, nobody knows when they're going to get sick. It's not something you can always plan. So, I always tell people I am available. I, I, I want to be a resource. That's that's why I'm here. That's why, you know, you're you're here at Oak Mill, so you have this resource. Um, but the best way to get a hold of me is to schedule it. <laughs> Um, so we have an apartment nurse every day, including the weekends. Um, I'm here Monday through Thursday from 7 to 3, and then um, some of you may know Scott from the short stay. He's going to be taking over for Kristen as the part-time apartment nurse, and then we also have Marissa on the weekends. Um, and they're here from 7 to 3 also. So um, we do have nursing care available in the events of emergencies, even after hours. So I always tell people the easiest way to get a hold of me or any nurse in general is to dial zero and ask for a nurse. Um, if you if it's not emergent and you don't need to talk to someone right now, you can leave a message and we'll follow up with you um, and and either schedule a time to meet with you or just um, have you come to our office, let's go to your apartment or um, just kind of see what's going on and investigate it further. Um, but in, in the event of an emergency, there is someone available 24 hours, um, and the health center nurses are available to come up after hours if needed. Um, so some of the things that I do on a daily basis or reasons that I um, encourage residents to reach out, there's a wide range of things. Um, some of the things that I do on a daily basis, I make a morning rounds, and if there's anyone that's having current health issues, um, just maybe came back to to their apartment from the short stay and they're still recovering and rehabbing, um, I check in in the morning and just say, hey, how's it going? Is there anything I can do for you? You know, what what troubles are you having today? Are you feeling any better? Those kind of things. Um, and then um, I also help with like if someone has fallen and they have a skin tear or they have a scheduled dressing, if they've maybe go, gone to um, the dermatologist and had a spot looked at and they need a treatment for it, um, we're available to schedule a time to, to meet and, and help with those services. Um, we also do help with some medication management or assistance. Um, there are some people that I stop in daily and bring them their medications. There's some that I fill a pill box for them um, for the week. And there's some people that prefer to fill their own medications but just have me oversee it and double check to make sure that they're doing it correctly. So there's different levels of assistance we provide, we always try to encourage the most independence as possible. Um, because like I said, the more you can take care of yourself, the, the less you have to rely on me. Um, another reason that we recommend people reaching out is if you have fallen, um, just reporting it so that we can kind of problem solve and see, you know, do you need to see a doctor? Do you need physical therapy? Um, is there a way that we can prevent that from happening again? So I, I know some people are hesitant to tell me when they fall in because you know they can get up on their own, they didn't need help, and they're very proud of that. Um, it's, it's not like I keep a, a tally and then three strikes and you're out or anything. It's just the more that we know that you're able to manage on your own, the less that you'll be on our radar. So sometimes I've had um, gentlemen in particular say, I feel like I have a target on my back, like you're after me. I'm like, I'm not after you. I want you to take care of you so I don't have to. So, um, you know, the more that you reach out and you're willing to keep that open communication, the more that I can trust that you um, know how to get help when you need it and that you are able to, to manage on your own. Um, we also have blood pressure clinics, so if you get a new medication change and your doctor is suggesting to check that regularly, we can help with that. Um, Tuesdays at 10 o'clock in the Benton Building on 4th floor is our blood pressure clinic. There's also one in Spring Street at 9.30 and then I believe um, when Scott starts, when Scott's at East, there's also a blood pressure clinic over there. Um, what else? Oh, um, if you go to the hospital, whether you know you had to be treated or not, um, it's always nice to know when someone's gone and that a current event is happening um, and that and to kind of follow up from that. If you have any scheduled procedures, even if you think that you'll be fine and able to return to your apartment and take care of yourself, we just like to know um, as a heads up in case something doesn't go as planned um, and we need to reserve a place in the short stay. Um, we would rather reserve a place and then open it up because you don't need it than be surprised to find out that um, 
something happened. So um, you can always just dial zero, leave a message, and just give us a heads up. Um, and then of course, um, we're asking currently for anybody that's getting the COVID booster, if you're getting it outside of the, the Oakland Clinic, just to let us know so we can document that you, you've gotten it or if you're getting it. Um, so like Sarah mentioned, um, our, our biggest role in independent living for um, healthcare services is just connecting you to all the other services that are available. Um, the thing I love about Oaknell is that um, even though that there's only one apartment in our set of time, there's a lot of resources that um, we can utilize. I mean, Sarah is a great benefit. It's so nice for us to be able to share an office um, because if she's meeting with somebody about something, you know, we can kind of discuss and see is there anything nursing wise that we could help support them or could they benefit from companion services and that kind of thing. Um, but we also encourage you to kind of look out for each other. Um, so we always encourage the buddy system, having another resident um, that you kind of check in on each other. I, I, the newspaper system is the best system I've seen and I didn't create it. Somebody came up with it, but if your newspaper is out past 10 o'clock, then your neighbor will call and ask me for a wellness check or vice versa. Um, it, there ha you would be surprised how many times there have been incidents where a neighbor maybe went to the hospital in the middle of the night and nobody was aware, and then the neighbor called me and then we, we found that out. So um, I always encourage you to be, you know, each other's buddy. That's why we live in this community. So um, again, we, we don't want people to think that we're the police. We're not the police. You're free to, to roam and do things on your own. You're not required to report anything to us. Um, but the more we know, um, the better, the easier it will be when the time comes that you do need more assistance, that we can um, have that history and help provide care. Um, so just to run through a couple of the other services that are here at Oakmill outside of the apartment nurse, um, we do have a nurse practitioner that's here on Mondays, Krista Ford. Um, I, th I think her hours are like nine to one now and she has an office in the health center, so you can just either call me or call the health center and schedule a time to see her if you need to. Um, Dr. Aird, the audiologist, is here twice a month. You can schedule to, to be seen by him. Dr. Craig is the podiatrist, he's here monthly. Um, we do have Leland Labs that comes twice a week on Tuesday, Thursdays, really, really early in the morning. Um, and you know, we get a doctor's order, and by appointment, we can schedule to get your blood draws here, which is a nice, um, amenity. Um, McDonald Optical is also here, uh, maybe monthly, I think, um, if you need like your glasses fixed. I don't think they do vision screening here, but they would, you know, help provide any maintenance stuff for glasses. Um, so we look at um, what people are able to do for themselves and what they need help with and really en encourage and focus on the things that they need help with. It, with the goal that they can eventually become independent again, that you know you just need the apartment nurse for a short time. Um, we start to open the conversation of assisted living and getting more assistance on a routine basis when you're starting to when a resident is starting to rely on the apartment nurse more frequently or daily to get through um, just basic acti activities of daily living, um, which is something that Jacqueline will touch more on. Um, we do have the great program of the companion services in uh, all the levels of care, um, but it has been a great um, amenity for independent living uh, to help get people to doctor's appointments, um, get groceries for them. I think we've really broadened our horizons with what that program can do through COVID um, because it, it really, uh, gave us more, more opportunities to get things to us um, when everything was kind of shut down. Um, the downside to that is then we get used to and comfortable, you know, getting room trays every day and getting our groceries delivered to our door. Um, and in a way we start to rely on that and um, lose a little bit of that independence. Um, so we continue to encourage people, you know, as COVID continues, we want to offer those services and have them available. But continue to encourage people to try to get back to whatever our normal used to look like. Um, which I think many, many 
you're all doing because you're here in a group setting, safely masked. So, um, but but we have seen over this COVID period that it's really weighed on a lot of people. It's, it's weighed on all of us in some ways, and for some more than others. And and for those residents that were already having um, health challenges and system failures, um, it really kind of exacerbated that and, and sped that up. So it does feel like we're just. We, we appreciate being able to open those conversations early and often um, rather than waiting for a crisis. So I will hand it over to talk about Thank you, Stacy. So um, I'm kind of the MC today. So just as we talk about, you know, independent living and how that, how do we know when it's time to think about a transition to assisted living there's any number of factors that, that go into that, and that every situation is totally unique. So I know the grapevine around here is pretty hot, and people hear stories about how, you know, what happened in what certain, in certain situations. Um, but from our perspective, I will tell you that um, there's always a lot of thought and a lot of collaborative dialogue around the uh, is issue of whether someone needs to transition. It usually starts with somebody noticing um, increased frequency in either physical issues or cognitive issues. And you know, those physical issues can be related to mobility or balance, you know, more falls, change in vision, increased dizziness, um, you know, arthritis, more trouble dressing or showering or, you know, those kinds of things. Um, cognitively, it may become, you know, you recognize that your memory doesn't work the way it used to, but it's also harder for you to just organize your, uh, your medications or to keep track of appointments or, um, you know, all the way up to seeing things that aren't there. So um, no matter who we hear those, those things from, so we can observe those things ourselves as we see you out in the hallways. We can hear it from other staff, sometimes dining or um, housekeeping staff will say, you know, an apartment just isn't kept as tidy as, as it normally is, or, you know, noticing some changes in somebody's daily habits, or not eating as much as they usually do, um, noticing that someone's lost weight. That gives us a sign that it's, um, time to do a little more investigating. And again, we can also hear these same things from family members. And on occasion, we hear these things from you. You know, some people are proactive and say, I'm starting to feel like I need to think about assisted living. And we welcome those conversations because those tend to go, um, psychologically, those are the easiest. The people who are open to the idea of a transition, who are open to the idea of getting more help, and recognizing that while they may be trading um, an apartment that they've really come to love and the space and the things that are around them, um, as important as those things are, recognizing that, that care and caring people um, are, are more than, than worth the trade. So, um, so when that happens, when that conversation starts to happen, that's when we get, I work with Jacqueline Craig, who's the nurse coordinator for assisted living. And then we start the whole process of doing an assessment um, on the resident, and with that, including information from family, physician, uh, any kind of recent service providers like physical therapy, um, in addition to what Stacy may have been providing in independent living. and then we kind of take it from there. So I'm gonna turn it over to her to talk a little bit about what it's like once, you, um, once you're once you on your way to assisted living. Thanks, Sarah. I don't know if my topic is as exciting as everyone else, but um, I like to start by just giving a little bit of a background. Um, I found out, I think last week, that I've been here for 14 years. So um, yeah, that was kind of exciting to hear. Um, 
I started at Oak Knoll as a CNA and primarily worked in the health center and then I became a licensed practical nurse and then um, moved down to Georgia to get some experience, well actually with my husband, now husband, um, and got some experience in a standalone assisted living down there. And so coming back to Iowa made me so grateful for having the experience that I had from Oaknall and to come back here with the not so good experience, you know, I learned down there. So I'm just so grateful to be here and very lucky. So. Um, Continued working as an LPN, became a registered nurse, and then shortly after I became a registered nurse, um, got the opportunity to become the assisted living coordinator. So um, I have experience at all levels of care in assisted living, working as an aide, an LPN, an RN, and then also in the apartments as a registered nurse and the health center, um, again, at, with all of those job titles. So lots of experience. I feel like I've seen and done it all at Oaknell throughout the years. Um, so to pick up, Pick back up where Sarah left off. Um, once we have initiated that somebody is going to be moving to assisted living, um, we get that input, as Sarah mentioned, from therapy, nursing, social work, um, primary care physicians. We welcome family, any family involvement that we can get, and then obviously input from the resident themselves. And um, we all get together and we form what's called a service plan. Everybody's service plan is catered to their individual needs. Um, we, uh, similar to independent living, we like to promote as much independence as we can um, to keep you in assisted living as long as we can um, to avoid a transition. So um, some of the services that we provide when we are putting together a service plan um, include activities of daily living, so transfers and mobility, um, assistance with checking in for meals, um, dressing assistance, um, showers, and um, bathroom assistance. So any level of assistance that you need, um, we cater that into a service plan. Um, some of the other amenities that I would say are offered in assisted living, we have 24-hour nursing available. So we have um, CNAs, med techs, and LPNs, and then obviously myself as a registered nurse. We're lucky right now to have Alyssa King as a registered nurse in the evening too. So. Um, residents have access to an emergency call pendant, medication management, um, coordination with your physician, um, coordination, a lot of coordination with medical appointments, um, transportation, ass assistance with ADLs as I mentioned, um, lots of reminders for activities and wellness opportunities throughout the entire community, getting people to where they need to go, hair appointments, um, to the pool. Um, opportunities, like I said, wellness opportunities. Um, laundry, EBS provides services and assisted living weekly, and then um, laundry services are also weekly. Um, grocery shopping, we are lucky to have Stephanie in assisted living, and she coordinates all of our recreation and wellness and calendars and reminders, and um, she does grocery shopping for the residents once a week, so that's kind of a newer amenity that really picked up with COVID. Um, and then trash removal or recycling. So again, we kind of cater those to what you can and can't do. And then my other primary job is to follow the regulations that govern assisted living, um, which is never <laughs> fun, but um, DIA comes for assisted living every two years. Um, so again, just making sure that residents' care plans are up to date. We do 90-day nurse reviews and check-ins, and then we do yearly evaluations, and then of course, as needed. Um, so when a resident's health status starts to change in assisted living, and I'm noticing that they need more assistance, um, similar to how the conversation starts with Sarah and Stacy, that conversation then starts with myself and maybe Kaylee, um, and also the transition team. So when we're noticing somebody's health decline in assisted living or they're needing more assistance, we usually start by bringing that to our transition team that meets once a week on Mondays. And that includes um, Steve Rowe, Kim Birkin Jackson, EVS, dining services, um, maintenance, and then all of our nursing staff um, in addition to therapy. So we get together and we talk about residents who are on caseload for therapy, um, any concerns Stacy's seeing in independent living, um, and that might trigger the conversation as well on my end for people who are needing a higher level of care. 
So um, typically then I kind of hand that over to um, the health center and we coordinate a transition that way. I will say, I mean, a, I don't have like a percentage, but a very high percentage of our transitions that happen in assisted living tend to be through um, an acute event that occurs, um, potentially a fall, and then maybe a hospitalization after that fall, and then typically a resident might need the short stay unit to rehab, and then at that time we're all in conversation and having care conferences, and maybe addressing with the family, the physician, nursing, that that resident needs a higher <coughs> level of care. Um, and so at that time, it's kind of a, a dose transition into the health center. So I will say that's a majority of our transitions that occur from assisted living. So. Um, I'll hand it back over to Sarah now, and um, hopefully we'll have more time to open it up for any questions you all may have again. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. The only thing I wanted to add about assisted living is you're still living in your own private apartment. So, you know, assisted living is in the Oak Crest building where uh, the site of the original fancy new Oak Knoll of 1966, where you know couples used to live in those those apartments together. Um, but you know it's it's updated, and what we found is that even though for for many folks it's a downsize from where they've been in independent living, um, the space that they're actually using in independent living and the space that's comfortable for them to manage at their current uh, physical and functional abilities is very compatible with the spaces that are available in assisted living. But it's important to know that you're still in a private, lockable apartment with your own things, your own t TV and your same phone number, uh, your own artwork on the walls and all of that stuff. So we do, assisted living does require a, a decent uh, amount of independence in order for you to be successful there because you are still managing um, you know, many hours a day independently in your apartment with the scheduled and planned care that the service plan outlines. Um, so I just wanted to kind of make that clear that, that the logistics side, so Jacqueline is you know, uh, overseeing the healthcare side. I work with maintenance and EBS and some of those other resources to help you and your family um, go through the logistics of a move and, and downsizing and all that kind of stuff. So, um, and you know, as Jacqueline indicated, the thing about assisted living, it is a licensed area, but it's it was created for a very particular reason. And actually it came out of more of a social model than a medical model. It was really, assisted livings were really what Oak Knoll is designed to be, which is a supportive community that enhances social engagement, uh, you know, to the benefit of the people who live there. Um, so the staffing ratios and the, the amount of care that, that is allowed or that can be given in an assisted living is limited. And so I think many people sort of confuse um, assisted living with more of a health center type situation where if they think they don't think they're ready for assisted living because they don't need a whole bunch of help. Uh, assisted living is really more for mainly independent people who need a little bit of help. And what I can say in the time that I've been here at Oakville, and I think those who have been here a lot longer than me would attest everyone feels like the, um, the demographic and the way people are aging is shifting. And so the kinds of things that Stacy does in independent living are the kinds of things that they used to do in assisted living. And the kind of things that they're doing in assisted living now are the things that they used to do only in the health center. So people used to move to, the, to assisted living because they needed help with their TED hose. And that was it. And that's the way it was built. So you know we have to kind of weigh um, we have to weigh the the balance of you know the changing needs of this population with you know the system as it's designed. Um, and so I just like to emphasize that with assisted living, we talk about a window of opportunity. 
There is a, a certain window of time where you are still independent enough um, but need some help that you would greatly benefit from assisted living. And I would probably say that every single one of you in this room are currently in that window. I mean, we have people who run the whole spectrum. Weather a window back there, sitting in the, uh, people who are very independent, just like you. Um, if you wait too long and wait till you need too much help, you, that window could potentially close and you would not qualify. You have to actually qualify to be admitted into uh, assisted living. And at the same time, then you can ultimately be disqualified out of assisted living if you start to need more help. And don't, don't need to get real specific about that, but you can sort of get see what we're getting at. If you're needing more and more help and you're taking up more and more time and you know more and more things, it's just more than the system was designed to provide. And so that's, those are the kinds of things that um, we're always in dialogue about um, and that when we start to talk about a transition to the health center, which includes the short stay unit and the loft unit as well. So um, with that umbrella, I'll hand it over to Kaylee as that's her area of expertise. I'm Kaylee Gilmore. Uh, it's on. Yes, it's on. Uh, so I, I work in the health center, the short stay unit, and the loft. Um, you know, uh, total in, in all of those areas, there are 58 beds. Um, the short stay unit is our short term uh, unit, which is 10 beds, private rooms. Uh, that people come to following a hospitalization or maybe some sort of surgery um, or some sort of acute health event that they would benefit from some therapy services, physical therapy, occupational therapy, <clears throat> speech therapy, uh, and with, with the goal to have that person return to their, their prior level of care, their home in assisted living or independent living. Um, sometimes, as Jacqueline said, Despite all of the services provided in the short stay unit, all of the therapy services and nursing care, um, an individual may not return to their prior level of function and um, will, will not qualify to return to assisted living or be, be safe and, and benefit in a independent living. Uh, so at that point, we talk about a transition to the health center, which is a, a longer term uh, stay location. So our health center is 30, has 36 beds. All but three rooms are private rooms. Um, we kept three rooms in the health center, double occupancy, just for spouses who might want to live together or um, siblings, friends, whomever. Um, so um, when a transition occurs, you know, I, we're, as Jacqueline said, we meet weekly with our transition team and then um, more frequently with a smaller intimate group, you know, maybe Sarah and I and Jacqueline, depending on, on where someone was living prior to um, transition to the health center. Um, we meet and talk about uh, what that person's preferences are. Um, we talk with the individual, if it's appropriate, or their family, their healthcare decision maker about uh, what room may be available, kind of the logistics of the move, the move and then identify a date for the transition to occur. Um, in the health center, uh, Oaknell provides a wardrobe, a dresser, a nightstand, uh, a TV, um, I think that's about it. However, sometimes people like to bring their own furniture items, so we welcome that as long as space allows. We we're able to, to move the Oakville furniture out and accommodate the, that individual's preferences. Um, it is a considerable downsize, even even more so from, assist, from the downsize that occurs from independent living to assisted living. Um, yet another loss for an individual, we recognize that, that it's not easy. Um, but welcome anything we can do to make that space home-like. Uh, um, artwork, pictures hung on the wall, 
special blankets or objects. Um, there are some, some people who have their rooms just completely decorated, uh, which we love to see. Our, our focus is on making, creating a home-like environment um, with, uh, with a focus more on the nursing care that someone needs at that point in their life. Um, we, there's a, a huge team of uh, people who are willing and, and ready to try and make the transition as easy as possible. Um, there's 24-7 nursing care. There are CNAs available to help with the, the daily tasks. Um, a, a great recreation department that has activities, um, scheduled activities throughout the month. We have recreation aides who visit with people one-on-one -on -one in their rooms or go on walks. Um, we have residents in the health center who help maintain our garden or plant you know, flowers. Uh, it's really, really, again, dependent on what is meaningful and important to that person. We do our best to try and accommodate and, and create uh, purpose. Um, there's a, a great dining staff. Uh, we have a Hope dining room. Um, there are some people who choose to eat in their room, so we, we do our best to accommodate that with tray deliveries. Uh, music therapist Megan, you all know her. Uh, volunteers who come and, and visit with people or help in whatever way someone identifies uh, would be helpful. Um, so in the health center and, and uh, the short stay unit and our loft, uh, it, it's he heavily regulated by Medicare. Um, however, that doesn't mean that someone is a prisoner and we, um, we try to accommodate movement across levels of care. So if a health center resident wants to attend a program in independent living in the evening, we have volunteers and other staff who can help get someone there and bring them back. Um, there are also folks who eat um, in the oak room, uh, the oak dining room. Um, people go out, um, a little less so this past going on two years, but um, people, th there's quite a bit of movement throughout the day. Um, people aren't stuck in the health center. Um, there are some people who have physical limitations or cognitive limitations that it, it makes it a little more difficult to allow them to go outside and move around independently, but um, we utilize at Home with Oakville Companions, our volunteers, our recreation staff, all of the other ancillary staff around the health center. Um, our loft is a 12 um, private room unit uh, on the third floor designed uh, to, for, for people who have a dementia diagnosis. There is a criteria that, that we, that there's a team of individuals uh, that can evaluate someone's uh, candidacy for the loft based on a dementia diagnosis, uh, dementia related behaviors. Um, as we identify someone who might be a good candidate for the loft, we initiate conversation with their healthcare decision makers and their family members talk about the, the difference in the loft. It's, it's more of a home-like environment. Uh, we really try to keep the, the individu individuals who have dementia engaged with um, helping. Uh, sometimes people, will, there have been people who have vacuumed, who have helped roll um, silverware. Uh, more of a home-like model than, than the health center itself. Um, I guess a couple more points and then we'll open it up for questions. I just want to tell everyone that um, we really do our, our best to advocate for one's quality of life and purpose. I know it's, there are misconceptions and probably nursing home health center settings that don't operate the way we do here at Oak Rule, but that's very important um, as, as someone is needing more care there's still very, very much uh, value and individuality and autonomy that we try and um, continue to foster throughout, throughout. So, anything to add? Questions? And can I just say, I think what we'll do is have you ask the question and then uh, whoever's up here can repeat it for the group, okay? In the future, does the health center remodel after the loft is 
sounds like the loft is more inviting. Question was, in the future, can the health center be uh, remodeled to, to be more like the loft and a more home-like environment? We would love that. I think there's, there's very preliminary conversations about what that might look like and whether that would be um, a few different neighborhoods. Um, yeah, I, and we're, we, there's a, all of us, I would speak for everyone, that we, we would be on board with a similar um, construction in the health center. So ho hopefully that's, that's where things will, will head. Uh, the question, question was, would you consider the loft a hospice unit? No, I, I would say no. So um, in fact, thank you for bringing that up. When, when we uh, offer an individual a, a room in the loft, we are really clear to explain that uh, there may be a need that the, the individual who would benefit from the loft environment at this point, there may be a, a time down the road when the, they would be better served in the health center. So um, most of the residents in the loft are, uh, don't require you know, two people to assist them for physical cares. Um, uh, I think as people age and maybe are, are uh, qualify for hospice care, they, they may be a little bit more withdrawn. Um, they may require more physical assistance. So, uh, so no, I would, I would not consider the, the loft a hospice unit. And in fact, if someone's needing that level of care, it's, it's very likely that we're having conversations with family about moving someone back down to the health center because there'd be more nursing assistance available there. Margaret, you? I just, I just want to second the idea about neighborhoods in the health center. Yeah. The loft was just marvelous. And, and yet when we were in the health center, on the west wing, we felt like we didn't belong anywhere. And so if we could develop that, that would be wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Margaret just seconds that, that idea of creating more home-like neighborhoods in the health center. Yes, I just wanted to say that in the loft there was a time when hospice was brought in, but it was not to provide the normal kinds of services, but there was a hospice nurse and then COVID, there was an aid once that hospice could choose and it was something to do with um, the availability of CNAs and so forth. So it could happen, at least it did, but then COVID came and they couldn't come in anymore anyway. Yeah. So it was... Um, very difficult for yeah. them to come in, but they were able to do things over the TV, like music, to augment what Megan and the group were doing. Um, some hospice people came via television and sat and played the guitar, and they could have music augmented to augment the other types of things that were there. So it wasn't an impossibility, it just wasn't very common. Right, thank you, Joan. Yeah, so, so she, she's explained that there have been residents in the loft who have received hospice care. Um, and you know, I think, and, and the hospice team was able to provide a lot of extra uh, supplemental services to what Oak, the Oakdale team was providing. Um, e each person's condition and, and change and, and progression of whatever disease they may be experiencing is very different. So we, we, we really would like to keep everyone where they are and minimize movement. Um, it's not always possible, but, but there are some instances where it has been possible. So it's, there, aren't some, there aren't real hard and fast rules to, um, to, the, to the discharge, admission and discharge of, of someone in the loft environment. Okay. Can, can we ask questions about other than the health care? Absolutely. Okay. One I had was, regard to routine blood draws. Uh, during the worst parts of COVID, we were able to arrange to have the, that person come by and do the blood draw rather than us heading out to the hospital somewhere. And then the last time we requested that, they said, no, we're not doing that anymore, not because it's not that heavy duty COVID. So that's news to me that, that we can still do that. I'm, not, I'm confused. Yeah, so question is, uh, there at one point there was the ability to arrange routine blood draws and COVID happened and something changed and now it's not possible, so. So, uh, I'm not, a, oh, sorry. 
Okay. Um, I'm, I think the last time we requested was this last spring or early summer. And um, we, you know, the, the doctor had given the order, we passed it on, and then we were told, no, we're not doing that anymore. So that is, that is what's true. You were told by you were told by the Oaknell staff that yeah. that the Wheeland's not coming. Either that, either that, or the doctor staff. But in any case, it's a confusing thing anyway for them to. Con you have to send faxes back, back and forth, and then burdens the report. So what I was told was we couldn't do that anymore. So we went out ourselves. So we yes. Do it. So I don't know of a time that Wheeland Lab was not coming um, to Oaknell. Um, I know obviously with COVID, it may have changed. I know um, that staffing, they, they maybe didn't have enough phlebotomists at one time, but it would have been a short time that they were changing, you so, know, so having enough staff. So it, it, the only thing I can think of that it may have not been possible for a short time due to, to a staffing issue, but um, yes, anytime you need a uh, blood draw done, you can reach out to us or your, you can provide a doctor's order to us and we can help you coordinate that. Mm -hmm. a, a, not quite a direct related question, but I had a procedure about a year ago at Mercy, and I could get myself there, but the Mercy would not be, because I was in a seat, the Mercy would not release me um, unless somebody would come get me who knows me, or I'm, I'm not sure what the connection was. But um, the routine transport by Oakland was not possible. And that, and we're in an event, in an event of that surprised me, because it was yeah. like it would be. Something that would be possible. Great, right. great, great question. Um, so his question was, um, he had a procedure scheduled. Oaknell was able to take him. He was not able to um, come back, come back to his apartment without being accompanied or someone to help oversee him. Um, and Oaknell transportation is not available after 4 p.m. Well, what's the name of the time? They just said we can't do that because it has to be somebody who knows you and, and, not, and gets you back to your apartment safely. And walk yeah. So if, if you ever have a scheduled procedure, reach out to us and let us know. Um, often, your doctor will tell you if you're going to be under anesthesia, you can't drive, you should be accompanied. Um, and we can kind of individually talk about, you know, would you need the short stay? Would you just need a family or friend to stay with you? Would you just need the apartment nurse to check in more frequently or, you know, have a buddy system? Everybody varies in their um, own abilities and so we kind of, uh, we like you to reach out to us when you have a plan procedure so that each person can have an individual plan that, that will meet their needs. I did do that, and I was told that it could not be arranged to have both my staff and the back. Right, so, so he's saying he was told that an uh, Oakville staff member could not bring him back. So for independent living, um, we do not provide transportation after 4 o'clock. So you would either have to have... Oh, it's 5 o'clock? This was like 2 in the afternoon. So Yeah. So can you say which which staff or what department told you that? Was it the transportation department? I think I talked to Stacy also. I talked to the transportation department and said, well, we can't do that. And then I, thought, I think I talked to Stacy. What I was told was, well, you're in independent living, so we do. that's something that you really need to take care of yourself, which I didn't think was really helpful. Yeah. So, so I would say reach out to the the apartment nurse ahead of time, and we can um, discuss the options or how how to arrange that. But no, we do not provide a staff member. You could hire a companion if they have one available for the time that you need. Um, but like I said, it's it's individualized. Um, if you felt you know that you needed more 24-hour supervision following the procedure, then we would talk about the short stay. It really wasn't me. It was Mercy didn't want to release me because they right. They didn't weren't sure that it would be safe like this. Right. So I have communicated directly with doctors before uh, of about uh, just educating them on what Oakland does offer and what the options are available. Um, you know, so, some some doctors and hospitals feel that if you live at Oakland, you must have 24-hour care at all times, and that's not the case for... for okay, well, thanks. Yeah. I don't want to take off any more time. I'm sure. sure there's other questions. Any others? Yes, Joe. Yeah. To what extent does Oakland chase physicians? If someone in Oakland is clearly needing medical care but doesn't have any contact with physicians, uh, will Oakland take the initiative or do anything in that? So 
So your, your question is, does Oakville chase down physicians? Um, I mean, I guess it would depend on what level of care you're in. If you're, if you're talking about you independently and independent living, um, you know, nursing is an amenity service to you. If you are having trouble navigating your own medical care, then yes, you can reach out to us. And um, typically, I prefer doing it together. Um, it's, sometimes it's a learning curve of figuring out what doctor to call, what phone number to call, who to leave a message for, what to say, um, that kind of thing. Um, you know, in, in assisted living and the health center where there's more nursing care provided, it looks a little bit different. Yes, Joe. If we know that someone is having difficulties and it looks when they perhaps made a visit to them that, wow, why is this person still alone in their apartment? I mean, they could barely, could barely get into the apartment, at least of all wondering why they were still there. Who do we go to? Yeah. You know, I didn't want to visit someone and all of a sudden they could call, but I was worried and yeah. supposedly at home at with Oakville was part of their Plan. Sure. But it sure didn't look like that to me. And, yeah. And so I, you know, you don't know where to go when something like right. that is what we're observing. Great question. So her question was, if we have a concern about another resident living at Oakville and we feel they're not getting the care that they need or, or services or um, assistance, who do we go to? Um, I always tell people to dial zero and ask for a nurse. Um, you, you know, you can talk to a nurse live and just say, I have a concern about so-and-so resident in this apartment, can you do a wellness check? Um, I encourage residents to also tell their children that they're welcome to do the same thing. If you have children that live out of state and they're trying to call you and they can't get a hold of you, um, they can call the front desk and ask for a wellness check. Um, but I, I would also add that there are lots of pieces especially in independent living that, that you may not see or you may not get the full story from that resident. The, the thing that always breaks my heart the most is when a resident is kind of suffering alone and they are not telling anybody and then you know a week later I find out you know a friend had stopped by and was concerned but never said anything. Um, when people aren't feeling well they don't always think like what should I do next or when to reach out for help. And you may, as their friend, see a much more drastic change than they see in themselves. Um, and so I usually encourage family and friends, don't ask them, can I contact the nurse? Just tell them, I think it's time to contact the nurse and I'll, I'll do that for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. I just wanted to add a little, you know, social work perspective to that response because at the same time, um, so, you know, I would say I would add talk to either one of us in the independent realm if you have a concern about somebody. Um, but many times that happens and I'm already, we are already aware of that concern and there is, like Stacy said, a lot of pieces that are already in progress and conversations that are going on that we just can't disclose. So um, I do run into sometimes that issue, um, especially if the if the concerned person, the concerned friend, isn't seeing the kind of improvement or change that that they would like to see, because the other thing that we value is empowering people's personal choices, and some people are living in a way that doesn't seem safe or clean or whatever to us, but it's how they've always lived and we're gonna, to the, to the best of our ability, empower them to do that, as long as it doesn't harm the community at large. So sometimes we find ourselves in that position of having to advocate a little bit for a person's um, right to make poor choices for themselves. <laughs> yes, Margaret. Good question. Um, the question was, if we get transferred, if someone gets transferred uh, to with the ambulance 
to the hospital? How does your end of life wishes get transferred? Um, so we only know as much information as you share with us. Um, so if you were to call for a nurse and they would help coordinate for the ambulance to come, they would also you know, share whatever information you provide, whatever information you have posted in your apartment or we have on file. Um, whatever, you know, we would hope that your doctor is already aware of who your medical or durable power of attorney for decisions is in the event that you're unable to make your own decisions, what your code status is, whether you want to be resuscitated or not. We would hope that in advance you would provide that information um, to both us and your doctor so we would have that. But if, if you did call a nurse, we would do the best we could to gather that information and pass it along to them. We would call the hospital, let them know that you're coming, um, let the EMT know a little bit about your history as much as we do know. But, um, you know, for, for many of you, you know, if you call in the middle of the night and you get a nurse from the health center, they may have never met you before. Um, so I always encourage people to either fill out like an emergency medical ID card. Um, you can get them at the front desk and it just has a little bit of history and the basic information we would need to help provide care. Along with that, then we should be updating our records with you folks, shouldn't we? Yes. And maybe at one point we didn't think we wanted X, Y, Z. And yes. all of a sudden we realize it's important to have X, Y, Z. Right. So, so it's our duty and responsibility to come to your office and yes. say, we better check my papers now. Right. So um, anytime you have a medical change, a new diagnosis, um, you know, maybe your spouse passes away and you update who your medical power of attorney is, um, we, we like to, uh, for you to provide that information. And when you do check in with us, then we can kind of go over everything and make sure that, you know, your children haven't moved, their phone number is still the same, that kind of thing. Yep. So, so we contact the apartment nurse? Yep, you can just um, leave a message and we can schedule a time to meet. But if you're at one upper east, that doesn't apply. You can also schedule. A, you can also call and schedule appointment. You would just call the front desk. So I need to do an emergency. Would we call nine one one first? Oh, correct. In an emergency off site, yes, you would call nine one first and then just report to us the situation. Yep. Yes. A couple of uh, question and a comment. During COVID, I had blood drawn, but when they called to uh, arrange an appointment, they had no openings, and they asked. So you were saying you had a, a blood draw that you needed to schedule here at Oakville or outside yeah, of Oakville? Yeah, because the uh, referral from the doctor, which was in the Mercy system, was already here. Uh, and then they was called and said, can you do or can you not or whatever. Yeah, so. You had to get up early. Yes, it is early. They come between 6 and 7 a.m. Um, in hopes of the people that need to fast before blood draws, they can do that. Um, so if you have any issues with blood draws and coordinating that, I would say just leave a message for the apartment nurse. It, it does take kind of moving parts because we're kind of the connection between the lab and the doctor and getting that. Yeah. My question though, I understand from some people on the outside that you are admitting people who have no connection, don't know, to short stay. Is that because it's just for rehab? Yes, I'll let Kaylee answer this question and repeat the question. So yes, um, majority of the people uh, who are admitted to our short stay unit are admitted under what uh, the Medicare skilled benefit. Um, so we, we do occasionally take uh, outside or people who live in the community and allow them to come here for their Medicare skilled benefit, which provides the physical therapy, occupational therapy, maybe speech therapy, and then a discharge home. We only accept those referrals when we have beds available. Um, we keep very close tabs on who's, who from the Oakville community is currently in the hospital, what kind of procedures are coming up. That's another good reason to touch base with Stacy if you have a planned surgery coming up that you think potentially you would need the short stay unit. 
Um, but we monitor those numbers daily, uh, multiple times a day, to make sure that we we will fulfill our promise to, to you all. Um, we we haven't been through COVID. We didn't take any community uh, referrals into our short stay unit. I think since we've opened a little bit, there's been just a handful. Uh, but yes, occasionally that does happen. Does that answer your question? So we're just going over time.